welcome to Frogs and Toads of the Rouge River Watershed from Friends of the Rouge. Uh, this, I, I really wish that I could be with you all in person today. I really miss seeing you all, but at least none of us had to drive on snow covered roads. And uh, because we're doing this virtually, we were able to open this up to people that don't necessarily want to survey, but just want to learn about frogs and toads. So I know we had about 137 people signed up. So that's really, really, really exciting. And we like offering this opportunity for you just to learn what, what those odd sounds are in the spring and uh, learn how important they are. So this is also part one for anybody who does want to survey. We divided it into two sessions. So if you do want to survey, we're expecting you to attend next Saturday to learn the details of the survey. This, this session today is just about the frogs. It's also a review for uh, veteran surveyors. I know it's really easy to forget what those calls sound like over the winter when you're not hearing anything. So uh, welcome. I am Sally Petrella. I'm the monitoring manager at Friends of the Rouge, and I've been overseeing this survey since 2001. And uh, we have two staff members that are assisting uh, with the webinar today. So Lara, who's been welcoming you, Lara Edwards, and uh, Jackie Ahekala. And then I'm really excited to have a, a co-presenter today, Kathy Abelson, who will be showing you a really cool app that she designed herself that will help you learn the calls. Friends of the Rouge is a nonprofit organization that came together in 1986 out of concern for the Rouge River and how polluted it was. And it's our mission to restore, enhance, and protect the Rouge River watershed through stewardship, education, and collaboration. And we do this through hands-on opportunities to clean up the river, pull out the trash, pull out the cars, uh, restore the river, uh, stream bank stabilization. Now we're even putting in rain gardens and also to monitor it so we can see if our restoration work is being successful. And that's what this program is a part of. This program is funded by the Herb Family Foundation, the generous, generous uh, support there, Bosch, and also by donations and memberships from people who care about the watershed like you. So if you are not already a member, I would encourage you to go to the website, therouge.org, and join up today. We live in the midst of one of the greatest freshwater systems on Earth with 20% of the world's fresh water in our very own Great Lakes. And we're really lucky in Michigan to be the Great Lakes state that is the most surrounded by water. So water, water everywhere. And even looking at an infrared map like this, not sure if you can see my pointer, but you can point out to people exactly where you live. So do you live in a watershed? I wonder. So Friends of the Rouge is focused on the water, the rivers, but we are also focused on the land because the way that we treat the land has a huge impact on water quality. So when we talk about a watershed, it's basically all the land that's drained by a particular body of water. When it rains or when you water your lawn and some of that water runs off, it goes into a body of water and that is your watershed. So the yellow map in the middle is the Rouge River watershed. Uh, the, in Southeast Michigan, we have three major watersheds. The Clinton to the Northeast, the green one here, uh, drains into Lake St. Clair at St. Lake St. Clair Metro Park, formerly known as Metro Beach. To our west is the Huron River watershed, which drains into Lake Erie, and then our own Rouge. So Rouge River watershed drains 467 square miles. It encompasses three counties, mainly Wayne uh, and Oakland, and then a very small part of Washtenaw County. It's home to 135 million people, and it has four major branches. The red one is the main branch that starts up in Rochester, goes to the Birmingham and Bloomfields and Southfield. 
the white one is the upper branch, uh, starts up in West Bloomfield, goes through the Farmingtons. The middle branch has two headwaters, Wald Lake being one of them, and then Johnson Creek, our cold water tributary. Those come together in Northville at the Northville Downs, and then you've got the middle branch um, that goes along Heinz Drive. You always hear about Heinz Drive being closed because of flooding. Well, they built the road in the floodplain, and so when the river needs to use it, we close the road down, and that works out much better than having put houses in the floodplain. Last but not least is the lower branch that starts out in Superior Township and goes through Canton, follows along Michigan Avenue. That's actually the branch where we are working on a paddling trail because it has consistent water year round that you can paddle it. Then you've got the uh, main stem where most of the industry is located. And a lot of people think that the pollution in the river is caused by the industry. Well, some of it, but 70 to 80 percent of the pollution actually comes from stormwater runoff in the Rouge and actually in most of the United States. And one of the things that can help mitigate those effects of stormwater runoff are wetlands. And this map is showing you the river system, but anything that's not that light blue in this picture are wetlands. And wetlands can actually absorb 72% of the runoff from a small storm. So what is a wetland? A wetland is an area where water covers the soil all or part of the year. So four things you need to look at, think about to decide whether you have a wetland or not. Number one would be standing water. So obviously this is a wetland, um, although not all wetlands have standing water year round. So you need to look for other things. Vegetation. You might see these cattails in the front of the photo here. So uh, that's indicative of a marsh. So there's a whole slew of plants that like to grow with their feet wet and that those would indicate a wetland. In this picture, you might see a certain animal there. There's an egret. So uh, that's a, a bird that, that lives in wetlands, uses wetlands. Uh, the things like amphibians would be indication that you have a wetland. And then the one thing that you can't see in this photo that wetland biologists use would be soils. There's certain soils that, that the soils don't get a lot of oxygen underneath the wetland. And so you can go to an area and look at the soils and tell whether it was historically a wetland or not. Um, and it's really important to define wetlands because there are protections or really wetlands of certain sizes are regulated as to whether you can fill and drain them. You need to get a permit to do so. So it's important to have a, a working definition. So we've got a wetland here. Next thing you need to know is what type of wetland is this? And with our frog and toad species, each species has a different preference for the type of wetland that they like. And the more different types that you have in an area, the more likely you are to have all the species calling. So right here, we've got a pond. We talked about the uh, cattails here, also known as emergent, so a marsh. So two types of wetlands in this photo. You go here, you see this is a wonderful mosaic of wetlands. In the front, you've got a cattail marsh. In the middle, you have scrub shrub. And at the very back, you've got a forested wetland, sometimes known as a swamp. So if you were in, in an area like this and it was spring, you would expect to hear a whole lot of species calling. Is this a wetland? might not look like a wetland, but this is uh, the preferred habitat of our most common species, the American toad. This is a wet meadow, and if you took a walk out here, you might notice some different types of vegetation, standing water, especially in the spring, uh, things like sedges, uh, perfect American toad habitat. In Michigan, we have lost 50% of our wetlands. And in Wayne County, it's more like 90%. Let me show you a map here. So Wayne County has lost 90% of its wetlands. 
Oakland County 55% and Washtenaw County 53%. So there are regulations around wetlands, but they don't always get enforced. And you as a citizen scientist can really work towards helping to make sure that those do get enforced and our wetlands get protected. Another thing in the Rouge, not only have we drained and filled most of our wetlands, but we've paved over over half of the watershed. So this map is showing impervious surfaces, paved surfaces, rooftops, highways, things like that. So the, the dark blue are, some of those areas are 100% paved. Uh, the purple are 55 to 77%. And uh, when you pave over areas, the land no longer has that ability to absorb and uh, filter rainwater. And it results in a very flashy river that goes way up right after a rainstorm and way back down. So that causes a lot of erosion, a lot of problems. And then you also think about all the contaminants that are getting washed into the river, the oils, the road salt, you think about this time of year. Uh, fertilizer, things like that. So doing things um, on your property to try to retain rainwater can actually help improve the watershed, like disconnecting your downspouts, putting in a rain barrel, rain garden, um, even taking out some of the pavement, uh, reestablishing wetlands. All of those things can go a long way towards improving uh, water quality for us and for our wildlife. So moving on, to frogs and toads, which is what you came for. So this is a photo here of American toad tadpoles. And um, amphibians, frogs, toads, salamanders, mud puppies, newts, they're all very sensitive to pollution since they absorb everything to their, through their skin. And with this dual life cycle where part of it, they're almost like a fish and they use gills to breathe, to needs for high quality upland habitat at other parts of their life, uh, their presence is a really good indication of uh, habitat quality. So in 1998, Friends of the Rouge was looking for a way to train volunteers to survey wetlands. And rather than send people out to look for standing water, look at soils, things like that, we decided to choose an indicator species, some animal that lived there full time whose presence would be an indication of habitat quality. So of course we chose amphibians and rather than choose something like salamanders that are difficult to find, you have to turn over logs, it's not very good for them. We chose frogs and toads because of their wonderful characteristic of calling in the spring. So you can identify what species you have, not even by seeing them, but just by hearing them. So we designed this survey to make an assumption that you don't know anything about frogs or toads. Um, you just need to learn their calls and you just go out at night and listen. And uh, we've never looked back. So how many species of frogs and toads do you think that we have in Michigan? And uh, I, I can't really look at the chat right here, but I will tell you we have 14. And in the Rouge River watershed, we focus on eight of them that we have for sure. Uh, we, we combine some that are really difficult to tell apart. So, and uh, when you go to learn your frogs and toads, it's best if you start with the early season callers. So, when you go out in a couple weeks, some of these may start calling. These will be the very first ones. And um, these are some of our smaller frogs, not all of them are. Um, and most of them prefer a type of habitat called a vernal pond, a spring pond, an ephemeral pond, ponds that hold water uh, in the spring, snow melt, but might potentially dry up in the summer. And vernal ponds are critical because of the absence of fish, which like to eat frog eggs, like to eat frogs, can be very harmful to our, especially our smaller frogs like spring peepers and chorus frogs. 
And vernal ponds are pretty rare and don't always get the protection that other wetlands do because if you go out there later in the year, you might not know that it's a, it's a vernal pond anymore. So critical, critical areas, hopefully uh, you have them in your area. And this brings us to our first frog. So how do you, how do you tell frogs apart? You don't want to look, uh, just use color because they vary quite a bit. This is a wood frog. It's a medium sized frog. And in wood frogs, the males are blue and the females are red. That's why you don't really want to go by color. But if you look at this frog, the distinctive thing about it is the mask behind the eye. So wood frogs have a mask behind the eye, medium sized frog. Uh, wood frog, like their name says, they like to live in wooded areas and they're obligate users of vernal ponds, meaning they will only breed if there is a vernal pond. They spend the winter close to the ponds, wake up and go to the ponds. Um, if there are not vernal ponds, they, they, they won't be able to reproduce. And there's something also unique about wood frogs. Unlike all the other frogs, they're what we call explosive breeders. So it doesn't mean that they explode, but it just means when they start their calling, uh, they will all go out to the pond and do all of their calling and all of their breeding in a week or two. So they're really easy to miss. It's the reason to get out there more frequently early on. They also are one of the earliest callers. So they'll start calling as soon as the ice is off the ponds. So sometimes even February, most likely, especially this year would be early March. So their call. Their call is a little bit like ducks quacking or chickens clucking or maybe even turkeys. So I'm gonna play this for you. Okay, I was just making sure that you could hear that. So uh, hopefully you have heard one of those before, and if not, hopefully you will hear one this year. So wood frogs, you know, what are those frogs doing right now? Um, they're down there sleeping, and with wood frogs, they actually could be frozen. And I wanted to show you this video that somebody made um, because it's just amazing what these animals can do. Uh, if we were to freeze salad like wood frogs, we would simply die. So I'm going to put this, this video up for you. Here's the thing about North American wood frogs. They're small. So it might be very difficult to spot a frog. Very small, but they're everywhere, just out of view, hiding on the forest floor. He's, he's camouflaged. His coloration is the same as the soil around him. You see him here? He's cold. You can find them here in southern Ohio and all the way up to the Arctic Circle. But wherever they are, once it gets cold with the first sprinkle of ice, this frog does something I didn't know was possible. As soon as the frog touches, just touches an ice crystal. This animal is going to freeze. Freeze, freeze? Freeze. Solid freeze. That touch of ice immediately sets off signals inside the frog, says Professor John Costanzo, that pulls water away from the center of its body so the frog's internal organs are now wrapped in a puddle of water that then turns to solid ice. I, I, I still can't get over it. it. It's really an amazing, amazing thing. There is no breathing, no kidney function. The heart stops. And there will be no heartbeat for a long period of time. It, you mean as in no heartbeat? Right. Nothing. Flatline. Flatline. For an hour or two? It could be for days, perhaps even weeks. Really? It sounds like it's virtually dead, no? 
We know that the frog isn't dead, but he's probably about as close as you can get to being dead. Yes. <laughs> so from the outside, this little frog feels like a rock, except that as it froze, the frog flooded itself with a kind of sugar. The frog's blood sugar is distributed through the circulatory system. It works like an antifreeze. It's harder for the water to freeze, so cells stay just damp enough for the animal to hold itself together until the springtime. When the days grow a little longer and the ground gets a little warmer, and then, well, a kind of miracle happens. After weeks or months of no heartbeat, none, suddenly there's a pulse. And that first heartbeat leads to another, and then another, and then within a day, and in the case of this little frog, it took about mm, 10 hours, the animal literally comes back to life. Spontaneous resumption of function. Why? We don't know. We don't know what triggers that event. And think how elegant a business this is. Because although the sun is warming up the outside of this little guy, somehow his insides, his heart, his brain, they thaw first. His insides warm up before his outsides. But somehow it all happens in perfect synchrony every spring. Yes, and it's going to undertake a very energetic activity. It's mating time. You mean hours after it thaws, it's going to do it with a lady? It's going to perform. <laughs> <laughs> what an animal. Can we say that on I TV? I don't know whether we can or not. <laughs> well, we just did. So, oh, isn't that amazing? That guy, that guy just cracks me up. But frog sickles, I love it. So uh, this map here is showing you some of our survey results. The uh, squares are where people surveyed and the green blocks are where they actually were heard. So only 16 blocks, 16% uh, of blocks had wood frogs calling. So they're not really all that common, especially in the more urbanized area. But we also may be undercounting them a little bit if people are missing them if they don't get out as often. So moving on to our next species, this is Michigan's second smallest frog, the Midland Chorus Frog, formerly known as the Western Chorus Frog. And we're not trying to show frog abuse here, we're just trying to show how tiny these are. Even a full grown Western Chorus Frog doesn't get much bigger than your fingernail. So uh, if you do see one, you're not very likely to because they're so small and they're hard to find. But uh, chorus frogs have stripes down the back, uh, different than the spring peeper that has a cross. I'll show you a little bit uh, later. So chorus frogs uh, use vernal ponds. They like them um, uh, fairly open. And they, if you don't hear wood frogs, they probably will be the first frog that you hear in the spring. They start calling in early March. And their call is likened to if you took a comb and you ran your thumb over it. So it's kind of a t -t 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 -t. And the recording that I'm gonna play actually has spring peepers in it too, the ones that just say peep peep. So you kind of wanna try to distinguish the peeps from the t -t 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 of the chorus frog. So here we go. So that was the chorus frog and midland chorus frogs are fairly common in the watershed, especially when you look out in the Wald Lake, Novi, uh, Plymouth area. Um, not quite as common farther down. 
So moving on to our next species, this is the spring peeper, and this is our smallest frog, but it's also the loudest. Know anybody like that? So spring peepers don't get much bigger than your thumbnail. Uh, if you do see one, they have a cross on the back. Their Latin name is Hyla crucifer. They will use vernal ponds, that's their preferred areas, vernal ponds, a little more vegetation than you have with a chorus frog, but they often are find, found in the same area. And this is probably one of the easiest to learn. You've probably heard these, heard these in movies. Uh, they just say their name, peep, or sometimes called the jingle bell frog. And in the early spring when it's cold, you know, these are amphibians, they don't produce their own body, body heat, and so they'll be slow, you might hear one or two, and then you get into a full chorus that could be just really, really loud. So that's what my recording is here, a full chorus. Okay, so spring peepers have a similar distribution to the western chorus frogs, uh, although they seem to be a little bit more sensitive and we've had a few years where we haven't heard very many at all. Moving on to our most common species in the watershed and this would be the American toad. So um, what are some differences between frogs and toads? Toads have drier, wartier skin. So you're gonna find them uh, far away from ponds. I oftentimes get people who call me up and say, I don't have a pond in my backyard. There isn't one for miles around. What's this toad doing there here? They don't really live near water except for during the breeding season when they need it. So another difference is they have shorter legs than frogs. So they don't jump very well. So leading to their choice of habitat, they don't like a lot of vegetation that they would bump into. So they like fairly open areas. So they like wet meadow, like I showed you in the picture. They will use roadside ditches, your backyard, uh, even golf course ponds if they don't have a lot of uh, pesticides. Uh, so uh, American toads will start calling in um, April. We always used to call April 15th, or we do call April 15th toad day. Uh, we thought that was the day they started, but now we've realized that's the day that you get the full chorus. So by April 15th, expect that you are he hearing the trills of the American toad. And if there is one species that you hear in the watershed, it's going to be the American toad. So let me play that call. It's kind of a trill and they'll come in at different pitches. And I love the sound. I've also had kids tell me it sounds scary. Let's see what you think. Okay, so 60% of all blocks have American toads. And uh, you might even see this block over here. Uh, we even have them down by the Ford Rouge plant. So uh, tough little guys they are pretty tolerant to some pollution, but still great to have them. So uh, this is my only X-rated picture. And this is uh, to show you why they're out there. They're not calling for our benefit. Basically the males wake up first and they head out to the ponds and the biggest healthiest males get the best spot in the pond where they set up shop and start calling, hoping to attract the females. Uh, and then they hope that this happens. So this is called amplexus and the large toad on the bottom is actually the female and you can see that she is laying a string of eggs and that's another difference between frogs and toads toads lay their eggs in strings frogs lay them in clumps so the females are larger in most frogs and toads because they carry the eggs around that's the male on top he's fertilizing them so hoping this will lead to tadpoles and uh it's pretty easy to actually see eggs and tadpoles uh, in your area if you have them calling. 
So now I'm going to move on to the larger species, the later callers that don't start calling until it gets more like 60 degrees. And these tend to be the more classic large frogs that, that you think about. And most of them prefer to use more permanent ponds. Two of the species, their tadpoles take two years before they transform, so they could not use vernal ponds. So here's our first one. I know what this is, named after the spots, the northern leopard frog. And focusing in a, a little bit more, this is what uh, you probably used in science class. So leopard frogs are um, fairly you know, medium-sized frogs. They're recognized by those spots. And um, they like to use the sunny open edges of lakes, or they will use both vernal ponds and permanent ponds. They are the most sensitive frog or toad that we have in the watershed. There has been concern around the state uh, with numbers going down, although they seem to have come, have come back. In the Rouge, we used to have a lot of these years ago and they've mostly disappeared. So they're pretty few and far between. So if you hear the leopard frog, you are really, really lucky. Lucky because they're rare, but lucky because they have the weirdest call. And they will start calling in April. So they're a little bit later, not one of the earliest callers. And their call is like a, a snore, or we've tried to replicate it by rubbing our hand on a balloon, but it's, it's quite odd. Okay, so that's the northern leopard frog, and we only hear them in 9% of blocks, so uh, fairly rare and uh, scattered around the watershed. Moving on to the next species, this is gray, and it's on a tree. So, oh, it's the gray tree frog, which is a little bit of a misnomer because gray tree frogs are like chameleons. They can change color depending on their environment. So they vary anywhere, anywhere from this gray that you see on the lichens on this tree to bright, bright green. We have two different types of tree frogs in Michigan, Cope's gray tree frog and Eastern gray tree frog but they're impossible to tell apart by looking at them. You have to do genetic analysis and their calls are very similar, especially depending on the environment. So we actually don't uh, teach people how to distinguish between the two of them because it's just too difficult. So uh, gray tree frogs, you know, they, they do live in trees. Uh, they live in, uh, they like woodlands, uh, but they use permanent ponds, unlike the, the, the wood frogs. And this is one that often gets mistaken for a, um, an insect because they start calling in May when you've got some of the insects that are calling too. So a little bit of competition and they will call from 10 feet up in the tree. So it seems a little bit confusing. And their call is a, a burst of a trill. So let me play this for you. Okay, so gray tree frogs uh, actually seem to be more and more common in the watershed. They are one of the more sensitive frogs, uh, so we're really happy to have them. This is one of our largest frogs, but not the largest. This is the green frog, so focusing in a little bit. Uh, one thing about these bigger frogs is you can tell the males from the females based on the size of the eardrum in relation to the eye. So if the eardrum is bigger than the eye, it's gonna be a male. If it's the same size or smaller, it would be a female. So it looks like we've got a male here. 
And green frogs uh, stay in permanent ponds and they don't travel very far from ponds. That northern leopard frog actually will travel quite a ways when they're not in the breeding season. Green frogs pretty much stay uh, year round close to a pond. So they're fairly large frogs. You will distinguish them from the bullfrog because they have a fold of skin that goes back from their eye called the dorsolateral line that uh, the, the bullfrog does not have. Uh, so green frogs like ponds that are fairly deep with vegetation. They do not start calling until temperatures are more consistently uh, 60 degrees uh, overnight. And their call is like a banjo string or we've replicated it by putting a rubber band on a cup. So here is the green frog and you don't really get a big chorus of them. Maybe you'll hear one on one side of the pond and another one call back. So this takes a little while to get going. Okay, so uh, green frogs, and actually I think we need to update this because we are finding them to be more and more uh, common. And like American toads, they are fairly tolerant. They've been known to fall into heavily chlorinated swimming pools and still survive. So one of our more tolerant species, but still a good sign to have them around. And now we are at our last species. So this is our biggest frog, the bullfrog. Uh, you might be familiar with the problem we have with invasive species, things like zebra mussels that get in and clog up our water pipes and are a problem. Um, bullfrogs are not a problem here, but they, uh, people have brought them down to South America and they eat all of the other frogs, so they're causing a lot of problems. Um, so bullfrogs are our largest frog. Uh, you can tell them from the green frog because they don't have that fold of skin back of the, the eye. Uh, you can see that this is a female because the eardrum and the eye are similar in size. Uh, bullfrogs like deep ponds with a lot of vegetation. Uh, you wouldn't expect to have a lot of them in an area because they're, you know, like all frogs, they're predators. They will eat whatever they can catch, which includes other frogs, other eggs, tadpoles. So they're not necessarily a good thing to have a lot of them around, um, but a few is great. Uh, they, uh, like the green frog, both the green frog and the bullfrog, their tadpoles are gigantic and it takes them two years before they transform into frogs. So you really need that, that permanent pond. And they do need that vegetation. If any of you live along a lake or a pond, I know it's tempting to remove all the vegetation so you can have your beach and get in. But it's always a good idea to, to leave some of that vegetation for the frogs. We can, we can share our world. So the bullfrog has a call that's a deep uh, jug of rum or rum, rum, rum. So here we go. There are a few green frogs in here too. So uh, bullfrogs are, are also not that common in the watershed, but like I said, you wouldn't expect them to be that common. Uh, we do have this unusual population down at the Dearborn Hills Golf Course where they uh, irrigate their ponds with water. So there's, there's water in them year round and they have a gigantic population of bullfrogs. Um, also, you know, we, we do encourage you to put in a backyard pond. Um, but let whatever comes, comes. We don't suggest you go out and buy bullfrog tadpoles because they'll eat everything else. So that's our bullfrog. That's the last species that I'm gonna cover today and the last one that we really have in the watershed. And just to give you an overall view here, uh, this is a map of the entire watershed. The, the yellow blocks are where people have heard one to two species. Um, and then when you get into the dark green, five to six, the blue are seven or eight. So you can see our most high quality areas with a lot of species because the more species you have, the healthier your wetlands are. 
are uh, up in the sort of headwaters region in the Troy area where the Brady's are, uh, some of the Wald Lake region, West Bloomfield, uh, Plymouth, Salem, and then through Canton. And then we still do have some pretty good pockets uh, around the U of M Dearborn natural areas. And I have some employees of the Ford Motor Company who survey at the plant. And since the plant put in some wetlands, they've gotten to here, I think it's up to four or five species. So if you build it, they may come. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play this uh, call for you. And uh, when you think you know what it is, then you can fill out that poll. So here we go. Uh, 48% of you were correct. That was the trill of the American toad. So very good. Uh, some of you thought maybe it was the Midland Chorus Frog, 23%. So somewhat similar, but that's more of a t -t 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 -t. whereas the toad is a trill. Uh, and the spring peeper, 17%. Uh, so that's more of a peep, peep, peep. And then the wood frog is our quacking. So great job. We uh, let me do a stop share here. Uh, we uh, we wanted to do that in part just to show you how it might take you some time to to learn these. And now I am. Oh oh. Now we're going to go take some questions. So Lara, yeah. do we have any questions? Yeah, we had some great um, questions coming in. Um, I'll sorry, start Jackie. With... I mean. Oh no, you're fine. <laughs> um, we'll start with this one from uh, Linda. Do only males call? That's a, that's a great question, Linda. Uh, yes, yes. For the most part, it's just the males, especially that, that breeding call that you hear when they're calling for mates. So occasionally you might hear a little squawk from a female, but for the most part, it's only the males that call. Great question. And then we have one from uh, Kathy. Are the frogs similar along the Clinton River? Uh, good question. Uh, yes, yes, I would say they probably have the same species. Uh, some of the ones that we don't have in the watershed uh, are only found up in the UP, like the Boreal chorus frog and the mink frog. And then there is a, a, a threatened species called the Blanchard's cricket frog, and that has been found in the Ann Arbor area. So if you said Huron, I may say you have one more. Um, but it's very rare and uh, endangered, and I don't think that you have that one in the Clinton. So I would say, yes, very similar. All right, and then we kind of had two um, about the, the tree frogs. Um, Holly asked, do Eastern and um, I believe the Copes um, frogs hybridize? Um, and then we had another question uh, that's asking, um, do the frogs actually breed in the trees? Why do they call from the trees? Um, those are great questions. Um, I think that they do hybridize. Um, and, uh, but no, they, they can't do their breeding up in the trees because they need to lay their eggs in water. And I showed you the photo of the, the toads in Amplexus. It's external fertilization. So, uh, so they can't do it up in trees. I know in South America, there are a few species that actually will lay their eggs up in little pockets of water up in trees, but, uh, our tree frogs need to be down in the wetland. All right, and then we had um, one about toads. Um, Holly asked, do toads have a cyclic um, mating cycle? Uh, she says, some years I have so many tiny babies and I'm afraid to walk in the yard. <laughs> Um, well, they're cyclic in that they do that every year, but we do find that some years are better than others, but that has a lot more to do with weather conditions. So it depends when the rains come and how warm it is and how long the rains stick around. Uh, so some years it's just a perfect storm where it's a nice warm spring and there's a lot of standing water. Other years it's 
it's too cold or it rains and then it gets really hot and those ponds dry up. And so the tadpoles don't make it. So it's really more dependent on weather conditions. And that was a great question. All right, and I see we got a, a bunch more uh, in. So I'm just gonna kind of look over some. Um, let's Maybe see. one or two more and then we'll we'll move on. So. Yeah. Um, here's a good one from uh, Brendan. Um, how have invasive species affected populations? Um, good question. Uh, we don't have any invasive species of frogs and toads, but we do have a lot of invasive plants. And I would say one that's probably had the biggest impact is uh, Phragmites or uh, reed, uh, uh, Reed grass is from Australia and that uh, plant you often see along the highways, it's got a fluffy head and that will suck a pond dry and will crowd out any other plant. So that's probably had one of the biggest impacts. So I think we're about out of time. Um, we will have time at the very end if you want to stick around if there are more questions. So I am going to stop sharing and I am going to uh, bring on Kathy Abelson, who uh, started doing this survey with her son. And um, let me do it. Whoopsie, stop share. And um, she thought it might be easier to learn these calls if we had an app. And since she had such great skills at doing that, that is what she did. So go ahead, Kathy. Um, thanks a lot, Sally. It's great to be here. And I appreciate the invitation to um, talk about Froggy Voice. Um, I'm going to tell a little bit um, in a short time about um, how I got started and then a little bit about how the app works um, and then how you can access it and kind of some next plans for it. Um, I volunteered with my son to do a frog survey many years ago. This was back in the day when the only real choice to learn the sounds was from um, a, a CD. And so it was uh, you know, a little bit more difficult. You would just have to play the CD over and over. Um, and I was actually really excited to volunteer because, you know, you get your own survey plot and you go out and you do your citizen scientist. And then I was very disappointed to find out that I wasn't very good at learning calls. Um, it was just something I didn't have a high skill level on. Luckily, my son was pretty good at it. And um, even better, his friend was a budding opera singer and she was really good at it. So I think we did okay in our surveying and we had um, a good experience overall. But then it came down to quite a few years later, um, I was working on some web app technology, working on some new technology and I wanted something to experiment with. And I thought back to my days of learning frog calls and I thought it would be easy um, to use that. They're visual, there's a lot to them, it's sound and everything to use it um, to experiment with. So I, just did a few um, and I got a couple um, people in the environmental business, um, Ian Abelson, who's a stewardship manager and Jess Getchman, who is a certified interpretive guy. They helped me early on in the process to make sure everything was accurate. And then they started encouraging me to grow the app, not just do one or two frogs, but do them all. Um, I got together with Sally um, and asked her if this was something that might be useful for the Friends of the Rouge volunteers overall and other people to use. And she agreed very um, wholeheartedly and encouraged me to develop it more. Um, and she put me in touch with Jim Harding, James Harding, who was an instructor um, and herpetology expert at Michigan State University, because we wanted to make sure it was as accurate as possible and had all the correct information. So. I'm gonna show you a little bit about the results um, of that, what I ended up with. So it's called froggyvoice.com. Um, when you go in, you just have to click that you agree to the terms and conditions. And then you can enter the site. Um, this is how it would appear on a full screen. Um, <clears throat> and right now it's set for single caller mode. So you can just click on, well, they bounce when they click because of course frogs hop. So you have to make them bounce. Um, and you can hear your wood frog. Um, you could go to your spring keeper. 
So some that we just heard, American Toad. We all know him now or her. Um, so that's how you, you can use it not only to learn the calls, but you could actually use this if you're out in the field and you just want to verify what you're hearing. You might not be sure what you're hearing <clears throat> um, is that particular frog and you want to get it accurate on the survey. So you can use this in a few different ways. The other thing you can do with this particular app is um, you can access the information screens. So on each frog, um, there's something about the habitat and there's something about um, what time they should be calling. So you know, oh, am I in the right place for this particular frog? Am I in the right time of year, the right season for this particular frog? And then that will also help you confirm that what you're hearing. Um, and then everyone has kind of a fun fact, um, one fun fact about the frog. Some of them have um, the notices that there's species of special concern in Michigan, not anything to really act on, just something to keep in mind. That might be um, some of the more rare ones, as Sally mentioned, that you might hear. Um, another feature of this app is, as you heard sometimes, or many times, frogs call together. So there's a chorus of frogs. Um, and to help you learn to distinguish between those, there's a multicolor mode. So you can, for example, press your northern leopard and your pickerel. Who else would call them? Maybe your chorus. And then if you're hearing that and you want to confirm your state, you might say, well, I don't think it's the pickerel, but I think it's these two. And that will help you um, um, determine what calls frogs you're calling. This app can be downloaded or it can be accessed. It's, it's actually a website, so it's a little bit different app it's, um, that has a lot of characteristics of an app, but um, it, it can be viewed on different screens, um, which means it's a progressive app. So for example, if you have, um, an, you're viewing it on an iPad, it might look like this. If you're viewing it on a mobile phone, it might look like this. Um, and you know, but but any type of device um, should be able to display it. If you have any questions about it or suggestions for Froggy Voice, or if it's not, um, you're not viewing it clearly on your device, you can always ship me an email here. Um, just fill it out and go ahead and submit it, and I should get it. If you well, I do say mandatory email um, for you to return your email because then I might have questions and be able to get back with you and say, okay, what exactly is happening on your screen? And that would be very helpful. Um, in conclusion, I'm, I'm still working on a few developmental features of, of the app, but um, I wanted to thank everyone who worked on it. Um, oh, and the app is free. You don't, you don't have to pay anything for it. Um, I wanted to thank everyone who worked on it, the whole development team. Sally was amazing working on it. And, James Harding and, and Ian and Jess as well. So I hope you get some use out of it and, and enjoy using Froggy Voice. So a big, big thank you to Kathy. Uh, there, Kathy, could you put it up there for just one minute? Because I, I wanted to point out one other thing that I, 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 I really liked that I, I don't know as she uh, mentioned, and that is that she's a bit of an artist. And oh. so she, she made these little icons for the frogs. And while they might look a little cartoonish, she worked very hard to make those uh, represent the important things. Remember I talked about the mask on the wood frog, the, the cross on the spring peeper, her favorite one, this little warty uh, American toad that has uh, less than three warts per spot, whereas the Fowlers has more. So anyway, she did a fantastic job on that. Thank you. So uh, I do we have time for any questions or should we um, just move along? Or do, we, do you want to take a question or two for Kathy? We have any specifically for her? Uh, we also can have a little more time at the end for questions. Yeah, we've got a lot of great comments saying that um, they're really excited about Froggy Voice. It looks fantastic. Um, so I hope everyone um, uh, takes it out in the field and is starting to hear their frogs, either um, with our surveying or, or just on their own. If you are interested in learning more about frogs and toads, we didn't write the book, but James Harding and Alan Holman have a really wonderful book 
uh, Michigan frogs, toads, and salamanders. Kathy mentioned uh, James Harding. He's actually the guy I contact if I have a question I can't answer about frogs or toads. And all of this is on our website. Our website is therouge.org and under programs, you can find the Rouge Frog and Toad Survey. So we have links uh, to, to the book. The book you can actually get as a PDF right now and you also can just Google it. And I saw some used copies for sale for $5. Sometimes a paper copy is, is great. Uh, and then if you go to our website, we have all kinds of um, information about each species. We have YouTube. Uh, recordings of the calls. We have a, 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 like a podcast. You can go to SoundCloud and you can download the entire CD that actually you know, has some talking about the different calls. Uh, so, so all kinds of helpful things to help you learn about our local frogs and toads. So while we didn't require it for attending this, we hope that you are excited about becoming a citizen scientist and uh, joining the ranks of our frog and toad survey. So uh, the doing the survey does not take a whole lot of time. Of course, you're gonna have to learn all those calls, which you're probably gonna do anyway. Uh, and surveys really only take three minutes of listening but you do have to go after dark uh, and we ask you to go out several times a month during the survey period which is March through June and of course in March a little bit more frequently so you don't miss that that wood frog that only calls for a, a couple of weeks. So uh, really the only the biggest constraint that people find is that if they have hearing problems this night might, might not be the best thing or if you can't stay up late after dark. I've had a couple people say it's past my bedtime. And with the survey, as the season goes on, you have to go out later and later because you have to go out after dark. But besides that, um, doesn't take a whole lot of time, maybe an hour or so a month, um, but it is just so much fun and so wonderful to, to, to really learn and then see what you have in your backyard. Um, in terms of the data we ask you to take, uh, and we'll explain all this if you come to the workshop next Saturday, but it's a very simple form where we're just asking a little basic information about your block and this uh, ponds, the wetlands that you survey. And then each time you go out, you just need to date and take down some information about the wind, the air temperature, precipitation, and then just check off what species are calling. So pretty, pretty straightforward, but just gives us so much information. And then the survey block, this is, this is an independent survey. We're not gonna be going out there with you. You're gonna be going out on, their, on your own. And you know this is a perfect thing to do under COVID. Go out with your household and to more remote areas and listen for frogs. Or for some people, it can be their backyard. And we assign, assign survey blocks, they're quarter square mile blocks. So if you know the whole township range section, quarter section system, if you purchased a house, uh, that's what we give you is a quarter square mile block. And they just need to be within the Rouge River watershed and have wetlands. So we will do our best if you sign up to uh, give you a block that is close to you, uh, convenient for you. Uh, if you don't have wetlands or don't live in the watershed, you may have to travel a little bit, but we find that people follow through if they have a block that's close to them. And you'll just need to spend a little time looking around that area, finding the wetlands, um, and then you'll go out at night. So if you uh, want to participate in the survey, then uh, you need to sign up for the workshop next week where we will go into the specifics. Uh, so um, we hope that you all are willing to do that. And um, so in closing, this is the, the end of the, the, the official presentation. Um, I just wanna say, I hope that you hear a whole lot of frogs and toads. And uh, I hope that you learn something about uh, our Michigan critters um, and how important they are. And I hope to see you next week. So thank you. And if you want to stick around, uh, we'd be happy to answer some questions. All right. So I will turn this over to Jackie, who's been uh, taking a look at all of your questions. I see a lot of thank yous. And, and again, a big, big thank you to Kathy and also for, for all that great work and for agreeing to be here on a Saturday morning when she's just buying and moving houses around. So. 
Yes, thank you so much, Kathy. And thank you, Sally, for that great presentation. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of go over any other questions. So if anyone has any last minute questions uh, they want to ask for uh, scooting out for the day, feel free to uh, use the Q&A feature right at the bottom. Uh, so I think this one is worth um, repeating while we still have um, a, a bit of people on. Um, what can we do to protect the wetlands? Oh, that that is that is a great uh, question. So uh, well, sign up for the survey is one thing and uh, get to know what you have in your area or your area of interest. And then it's a really good idea to stay aware of what's going on. Um, as somebody who's out there surveying your wetlands, um, a lot of these wetlands are places that people don't really get to. And so by you being out there, you know, look for things. We've had surveyors report, you know, dumping into a wetland or vegetation being removed illegally. So you can watch it. Um, also, one of our biggest problems in the watershed is that there's a lot of development pressure. And, uh, you know, I can, I can speak about one area that I had a, a gentleman who had been surveying it for years and then the, the forested property was bought up and um, the trees all taken down, the wetlands drained and a shopping center put in. So um, it's good for you to remain cognizant of what's going on in your community because while they could destroy the wetlands, there's some regulations around that. And the more people that are uh, uh, educated, that are knowledgeable about what species are there, uh, when that person goes in to put in a, a permit to change it, you could go comment on it. And that would be very helpful because the regulators can't do much with people saying, I don't want that developed because you know I, I like that wild area. But if you can come and you can say, well, I have eight species of frogs and toads in this area, it's gonna really harm the environment by removing that wetland, that is definitely more powerful. So if you can stay attuned and get involved. And sorry, that was kind of a long-winded answer. There's lots of things that you can do. Yeah, yeah, that was a great, great question. Uh, this one's kind of similar. Uh, they're asking the four factors of a wetland, and I assume they mean like the vegetation, um, the amount of water. Yeah, yeah. So um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA have regulations around wetlands, and so that's why you've got those four different factors: standing water, but you know sometimes there's not standing water, wetland vegetation, and soils. And then they more recently added the, the wildlife that's wetland dependent would be somewhat indicative. If you're a wetland biologist, you have to know all of these things because they do a lot of delineation to figure out if it's a wetland or not. And then I'll just answer some of these. Uh, Emily asked, uh, do we publish our yearly survey results online? And yes, we do. Uh, go to therouge.org. Uh, to find out more information, we have our um, 2020 information on there. If you're curious, um, if you want to sign up for surveying and you want to see in your neighborhood uh, what other species people were hearing, we can practice those calls. Um, so absolutely we do. Let's see. Um, and yes, we are recording today's webinar uh, for anyone who is wondering. Uh, so we will be posting this online uh, for you to revisit, um, share, uh, all that great stuff. So absolutely. Um, let's see. Julie was asking about uh, decorative backyard ponds and if they support frogs and toads in the same. Um, hmm, good question. Um, not sure quite what you mean by uh, decorative. Uh, because in my mind, it can be decorative and it can still support frogs and toads. So I think it depends uh, what you do. You know, decorative, I think maybe you have a pump and you have flowing water and that's, that's fine. Uh, one thing about backyard ponds is if there is, you really need to have some vegetation around the pond and areas where they can go. Uh, during the winter time, bury themselves under rocks. Uh, so if you can put some cattails and other things in there, it would it would really be helpful. Um, but I I know that they will use, especially your toads, 
who aren't that picky uh, will use a backyard pond. And we even have a problem with people who have swimming peel pools and they have them covered over the winter time. And oftentimes you get that filling up with water and other stuff and the toads will find that and they'll start using it. And we've had to do some rescues to get them out of there before the homeowner went and cleaned out their pool. Uh, and then let's see, uh, we had a question from Adam of, uh, about the Clinton River watershed and if they do surveying for frogs and toads as well. Uh, they don't, they have considered doing it, but they don't have an official survey. There is a statewide survey uh, with the Michigan DNR. I don't know if they're continuing to take volunteers. And uh, they do their survey more like a route where you drive and you stop uh, every mile for uh, every quarter mile, like 10 different stops. Uh, I tried to do that in the Rouge, but in the Rouge, our populations are so uh, scattered that it just didn't really work, but you could look into that. Um, also, I would encourage you to contact the Clinton River Watershed Council, talk to Eric and say, hey, I think you guys need to do this, because he was thinking <laughs> about it. Awesome. Yeah, we, we would love for you all to show your support in whatever watershed that you are. Um, let them know that, that you want to hear the frogs and toads and that you support this kind of work. Because uh, we think it's a really great program. Uh, we love our citizen scientists. Uh, we get so much information from it. And it really helps uh, to guide the rest of the work that we do at Friends of the Rouge as well. Uh, let's see. Um, Barbara had asked this um, kind of before the presentation started, so this is a little off topic, but she said, uh, Sally, I saw your interview on one of the local news networks regarding uh, measuring salt in the river. Um, does calcium chloride contribute to uh, the saline measurement, or is it okay to use? <laughs> okay, a little bit off topic, but um, yeah, I was interviewed by uh, Channel 2 about road salt, and we we actually have been testing for road salt as part of our uh, benthic monitoring. We did it as part of our stonefly search. Uh, so um, calcium chloride, anything with chloride in it is detrimental. That's actually what we're measuring is not salt, but chloride. So yes, calcium is detrimental like road salt, but with a caveat there that calcium chloride works at lower temperatures. Road salt only works to 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Calcium chloride will work at a far lower temperature. And also calcium chloride, you use less of it. So because of those things, and you do need to use less, sometimes people just dump as much as they would with the road salt. So, so it, uh, yes, it can be a little bit better than um, the, the, the road salt that we normally use, the sodium chloride. Um, unfortunately, there's nothing that's perfect. And our best advice is to try to remove as much of the snow as you can prior. It always drives me crazy when I see salt trucks coming down, pouring salt on top of five inches of snow. Remove it first, remove it first, and then use as little as possible. And if you can even, even use some things like kitty litter or even sand, I mean, obviously you don't wanna do that where that's gonna flow into the river because that is the biggest problem with the salt is that it doesn't go away when it rains, it washes right into our water bodies. So best thing is to try to minimize your, your use. Uh, and then Kristen had a question, uh, is Friends of the Rouge using or supporting MI Herp Atlas? Oh, I great question. Yes, uh, we, yes, we do. Uh, that's a, a whole project to uh, keep track of herps. So not only frogs and toads, but turtles and snakes and things around the state. And um, one of the people who got that going, David Mifsud actually used to be employed by Friends of the Rouge and did some of this work. So uh, yes, we do send them our results, uh, which reminds me, I need to send our 2020 results to them. Um, they, they, it's, you can't really go to their website and see where you find the amphibians because they don't really like to be specific because they're a little fearful that people might find that out and go eliminate a population. But, but yes, we do contribute to that. Thanks for the question. And you can Google it, Mish Herp Atlas. Uh, let's see. I think that was all of them, um, that we had, um, 
Kathy said, do they sound different? I assume this is referring to the tree frogs. Um, Sally did say um, that the two um, tree frog species do sound uh, a little too similar um, to have our surveyors trying to um, uh, tell the difference with those. Um, yeah, that's that's a that's a good question. Um, they are very similar. The problem is that if it's a little bit warmer, then because one like is a little bit melodical and one's a little bit faster, so it just gets very very difficult to tell them apart. Um, so we kind of leave that to experts. And uh, when we designed our survey, I mean the, the 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 state actually with their survey, they ask you to assess population in a way, like you say, well. Am I hearing a couple individuals? Am I hearing a group or am I hearing a full chorus? And they even found with that that our volunteer, the volunteers were not very consistent about assessing that. But volunteers have been shown to be able to identify the species uh, uh, very well, doing a great job. But with the with the tree frogs, yeah, we just it's easier to it, it, I mean the you can go to our uh, SoundCloud or you can um, listen to, to Kathy's froggy voice and you'll see them both and you can try to tell them apart. But for our purposes, we just call them gray tree, gray tree frogs. So. Thank, you. Thank you everybody for attending. Thanks again to, to Kathy and to Jackie and Lara. And I hope that spring comes soon and we hear a whole lot of frogs and toads. So enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.